Before we talk about uh, extending these linear classifiers to nonlinear classifiers, let's do an example. Let's actually work through an LDA with some real data set. Uh, and because it's a little bit easier to work with one-dimensional data than two-dimensional data, we won't do these with images. We'll do these with one-dimensional spectra, uh, and in particular spectra for predicting cancer. This is actually based on real data uh, from a project I worked on many, many years ago to try to predict whether somebody is likely to have um, a diagnosis of ovarian cancer uh, before traditional techniques could uh, detect them. So here's the problem we are going to try to solve today. Mass spectrometry is a tool for determining the masses of uh, biomolecules and biomolecular fragments present in a complex sample mixture, like human blood. The mass spec uh, observed by samples is a function of the molecules present. A, spe a spectrogram is a 1D, as promised, signal in which the horizontal axis corresponds to a mass and the vertical axis corresponds to the intensity, if you will, indicating the presence of molecules of a given mass. So we are going to be given spectra from patients who have an early diagnosis of ovarian cancer and patients with no signs of ovarian cancer. And we are going to try to build a classifier based on these spectra to pre-screen patients for ovarian cancer based on these simple mass spec that are very, very easy to uh, measure and extract by just extracting blood. All right. Um, obviously, I'm going to pr provide you with the data set. And so let's start going through the code and putting all the pieces together to do an LDA. All right. First thing we have to do, of course, is load the data. So this is just a little function here that I've written that's going to load our CSV data. So we have two uh, CSV files, one for patients with ovarian, pre-screened for ovarian cancer, one without. We'll call that um, M1 and M2. So we're going to, so those are the CSV data. We're going to load them in with this little function here. I won't bore you with the details of it, but what it is going to do is, is return you a matrix M where each row is um, a spectra associated with a single patient. And there are, in this case, 10,000 patients, and the dimensionality of the data is 1024, 1024. Okay, so you have a matrix, um, patient one with 1024 features. So think about the problems we've been looking at with two features, but now we are in a 1024 dimensional space. And as I said before, we have 10,000 with, 10,000 without, class one, class two. This is just to tell me that um, my data was uh, properly uh, uh, loaded in. So I should have two matrices now that are 10,000 by 1,024. And I would like to build a classifier. I've said it before, I'll say it now, and I'm gonna say it again. Look at your data. Always, always look at your data to make sure that things make sense. Now, these are two of the spectra. I've just plotted the first one of each. It may not at all be obvious that they're correct. I have looked at these spectra before. I know that they are about what I expect them to look like. They're not all zeros, they're not all ones. And so these are the spectra. And now, by the way, you can see how hard classification, I mean, we've been playing with these toy examples where we have a bunch of blue dots in one corner and a bunch of red dots in the other corner and like how hard can it be to build a classifier for this? But now you're dealing with a high, high dimensional uh, problem where you can't simply visualize um, what, the, what the classifiers are going to do. And now you can see why these are really challenging problems. So let's build a linear classifier. What do we need to do? We need to build a bunch of matrices. We need to build, we have to compute some means, we gotta compute uh, covariance matrices, and then we gotta compute the SB and the SW for the between class and the within class, and then we're gonna compute some eigenvectors. All right, so we need the means. Remember, I have M1, which is for each row, patient, and features. I need the mean of that, so I'm gonna compute the mean of that. That should be a 1024 vector, so I'm gonna compute a row-wise uh, mean going down and mu2 is the mean for the second class, m2. Now you can see why I loaded them in separately so I can manipulate them separately without having to j um, jiggle um, everything within a single data structure. And then the overall mean is just the mean of those two. And the reason why I can do this here is because those two have the same number of samples. If they didn't, obviously I would have to weight these differently. All right, so there's my three means that I mean I need. Now I'm going to compute my zero mean data. So I'm going to take class one and subtract it from mu one. I'm going to take class two and subtract uh, mu two. And you can see that I'm using um, the matlib rep mat. I'm going to, my remember M1 is an N 
by 1024, 10,000 by 1024. I'm going to take that mu and I'm going to make a, a matrix that's 10,000 by 1024. And then I'm going to do a, point, a pointwise separate um, subtraction. So each vector associated with a patient gets zero mean. Same thing for uh, M2. Good. So M1z and M2z are now the zero mean data. And now I can go ahead and compute my within and between class um, uh, matrices. So here's SW, here's SB. SW is just the covariance matrix of class one plus the covariance matrix of class two. And SB is, remember, it's that product between mu one minus mu and then plus uh, the product of mu two minus mu. Um, and then I've got the times the, the N here for the scaling factor. And now once I have those two matrices, SW and SB, I'm home. I just have to compute a generalized eigenvector. So uh, be careful, by the way, um, eig is the eigenvector um, function and eig h is the uh, generalized eigenvector, which takes two matrices, SB and SW, and returns the value in the vector. Here, because I happen to know that, this, although I think this is a dangerous thing to do, this returns the eigenvectors um, sorted in reverse order, smallest to largest. So I'm gonna grab the eigenvector associated with the largest or the last eigenvector. I've actually said before um, that you probably shouldn't do this and you shouldn't. I should probably sort the eigenvalues here and make sure I'm grabbing the largest one just in case um, that they're not in fact in sorted order or something changes in the library. Now, once I have that eigenvector right here, I'm home, I have a classifier. What is that eigenvector? In this case, print out the dimensions of that. It's a 1024 vector. So think about all of my data. I've got 10,000 points floating around in this 1,024 dimensional space. And I have some vector cutting through that 1,024 dimensional space. And I'm gonna project all of the points onto that. And now I've reverted this to a one dimensional problem. That's exactly what we wanna do for LDA. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna project the data onto the LDA axis and we're gonna visualize it. So take every row in here and project it onto the eigenvector, the generalized eigenvector. And now we have P1 and P2, which are just scalar values. And I'm gonna just plot a histogram of those values. And what you can see is the first class in blue and the second class in orange here are not perfectly separated. What would a perfect classifier have looked like? Well, if the projected values, which is this value here, are completely separate from each other. So if you have perfect classification, there's no overlap between those distributions. Almost never, never happens with the real data, of course. But we've got a pretty good separation. Well, how good? Well, let's compute the rock. So this is a little bit of code for computing the rock. I'm gonna iterate through all of the various thresholds from one side to the other. And I'm simply gonna count how many things in P2 got classified as P2, how many things in P1 got classified as P1, and I'm gonna compute the true positive rate and the false positive rate, which I'm doing right here, and then I'm going to plot the rock. So let's see how we did. All right, true positive rate here. How many things in class one got classified as class one? False positive rate, how many things in class two got classified as class one? And again, remember what we want, we want fast rise up and then cut over. This is pretty good. AUC here, I forgot to write it out, is about 0.9 or so. Pretty good classification. It means with a relatively low false positive rate, saying that somebody who doesn't have cancer has cancer, you can detect somewhere around 75 to 80% of ovarian cancers. Now, is that good enough to release into the field? That's for medical experts to figure out. We won't go down that road right now. So please take some time to look through this code and look through all the details. Um, there's lots of little things I did in there that I didn't describe here that are important to, uh, to when you go to implement these things um, beyond just the mathematical formulation. All right. Now, two things we're going to do next. We're going to talk about, we've been doing with only two class classifiers. So I'm, I'm gonna briefly talk about what happens when you have multiple classes. And we're gonna just dip into a little bit of what, how do you think about nonlinear classifiers before we get into support vector machines and artificial neural nets, sort of the big machinery in image classification.